Hey guys, Michael Hyatt here. If you're watching the replay of this live Periscope broadcast, thanks for watching. And just keep in mind, you can still give me hearts if you hear something that resonates with you or something you agree with, but it's great to see you guys. This is the Virtual Mentor Show, where my goal is to give you the clarity, the confidence, and the tools that you need to win at work and to succeed at life. And today we're going to be talking about why books still matter, three lessons I learned in an interview that I did with Dr. Ben Carson. And I'll be talking about that more in just a minute. So, life is great today, Kevin. Thanks for asking. Hey, from California. Where are you guys from today? Peoria, Illinois? House of Britain? Good to see you. Hello from upstate New York. I love upstate New York. Montana. Went fishing there this spring. It was fabulous. Hi from Dallas. Minnesota, Copenhagen. Hey, Niels. London, New York City. Was there last week. Hello from Colorado, one of my favorite states in this uh, great country. Russia, we're in Russia. Paducah, Kentucky. Ralph from California, Austin area. I lived in Waco for a number of years, so I'm definitely familiar with Central Texas. Northern Nevada, never been there. Dallas. Awesome. Guys, great to see you today. In case you're joining us for the first time, again, my name is Michael Hyatt. I'm the author of the New York Times bestseller platform, Get Noticed in a Noisy World. I'm also a professional blogger, if you will, over at michaelhyatt.com. I get about a million page views a month there. I also have a podcast called This Is Your Life, which you can find on iTunes or Stitcher. Just search for my name and you'll find it there. And last but not least, I've been married for 37 years to my lovely wife, Gail. We have five grown daughters. We've got four sons-in-law, which means one of the daughters is still single, and we have eight uh, grandchildren. But again, um, this is the Virtual Mentor Show. My goal is to give you the clarity, the confidence, and the tools you need to win at work and to succeed at life. So if you're tired of drifting and ready to start designing the life that you really want, you've come to the right place. And today, we're going to be talking about the blog post that I posted today which is called, um, I actually don't remember what I called the blog post, but it, the, what we're going to be talking about here is why books still matter. I think I called it the secret, uh, secrets from Ben Carson or something like that. But it was based on, a, uh, on an interview that I did with Dr. Carson a few years ago. Let me tell you about how that interview came uh, back. And somebody just asked, what equipment do you use to broadcast this, an iPhone? Actually, I'm using an iPad. The reason I'm using an iPad is because I can see the comments. The iPhone was so small, I couldn't see the comments. So I thought, well, I'll just use the camera on the iPad. It's not quite as good as the iPhone, but uh, I think it's good enough. So at any rate, um, yeah, in landscape. By the way, if you're not seeing this in landscape, or if the comments are running the opposite direction from the picture, you need to upgrade to the new version of Periscope, which allows for landscape mode. And if it looks funny, you're tired of the comments running over my face because you're trying to look at it on your phone in landscape, Hold your phone in portrait mode, okay? And that'll put me at the top in landscape, and the comments will be on the bottom. It'll all be good, and you'll be able to watch it without the distraction of the comments rolling over the top of my face. So hopefully that, that's helpful. Um, I would love it if you guys shared this. It would share this before I get into the content today. I'm going to go for about 10 or 15 minutes on the content. Then I'm going to open it up for questions about the content and... Anything you want to talk about today, whatever you want to talk about, I'm wide open to talk about anything. But if you would share it, that'd be great. Just swipe left to right, and then you can share it with your followers. You can share it on Twitter. You can share it on Facebook like Emily just did on Twitter. Thank you so much. Debbie, thank you for inviting your followers. Lisa Ann Carlson just invited her followers. Uh, DeSeal, share it on Twitter. I hope I didn't botch your name. Um, yeah, how do you manage time? Bunch of great questions. We'll get to those eventually. So several years ago, I was asked by an organization called Giant Impact if I would be involved in uh, their signature event called LeaderCast. LeaderCast, I don't know if you've been to it. How many of you have been to LeaderCast or have watched the LeaderCast uh, broadcast, maybe in your local community or in a church or something, uh, a business? You know, that'd be, yeah, lots of shares. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Yep, yes, sir. I love LeaderCast. I from Puerto Rico, hosted it. Mark said he hosted it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, for several years, I did the backstage interviews. So as the speakers would come off the stage, 
I got to interview him. So it was amazing. I got to talk to people like uh, Marcus Buckingham and John Maxwell and Coach K and a whole bunch of really amazing people. But one year, this was back in 2011, I got to interview Dr. Ben Carson. Now, this is somebody I'd read before, and this is somebody I admired, but I had never met. And so I got to meet him. He's much like his public persona. He's uh, quiet, gentle, uh, confident, but just very other-centered, and, and I loved him. And uh, by the way, if you're looking for a political fight today, you're on the wrong scope, Okay. So I, I've had it about up to here on these kinds of issues. This is not a political endorsement of Dr. Ben Carson. Okay, so I admire many people that I wouldn't vote for for president, but that doesn't take away anything from their life or their impact. And yes, he is humble. So this is not a political endorsement, and I don't expect a political fight, not on this scope. So, um, and, and the reason I'm saying that is because my blog post this morning has already drawn political fire from people that obviously didn't read it, but just took it as me giving him a blanket endorsement. And I said right in the post, if they'd read the you know third paragraph of the post, I said, this is not a political endorsement. Why do we even have to say that today? You know, but everything gets so polarized. Um, it drives me crazy. I said yesterday, because we did talk politics yesterday, I said, you know, I, I learn a lot from people I disagree with. You know, there's things that I, I, I'm, I'm very opposite from Hillary Clinton. But there are things that I admire about her. You know, there are things that I admire about Bernie Sanders. There are things I admire about George W. Bush. There are things that I admire about uh, Bill Clinton. There are things I admire about Mitt Romney. And I think there are lessons that if we're humble and if we're open, we can learn from everybody. Does that mean that we have to ingest or agree with everything? Absolutely not. And I just, I don't understand the cultural climate we have today where there's so much stinking polarization. And I think this is an opportunity for you and I to lead, to set the example, to show that we can engage on topics that may be construed to be political, but do it in a grown-up way and have a civil, decent, respectful conversation. And that's what's so uh, often missing from these conversations is that they're not respectful. You know, they end up being, you know what the word ad hominem means? You know, from the Latin, against the man. When I was uh, a philosophy major at Baylor University, I, I had a logic course where we looked about, uh, or where we studied, um, you know, logical fallacies, logical inconsistencies. And one of the primary uh, argument gaffes, things that you shouldn't do, is the ad hominem argument where you attack the person rather than the issue, okay? Because the person has really little or nothing to do with it. And I think it's, it's frustrating to me, and it's probably fl frustrating to you, that there is, as Ethan just said, so much mudslinging going on today. So I think we, we've got to be careful, and I think we have to set the pace, and we can't allow the people that are around us who engage in that kind of political mudslinging, that kind of polarization, we simply cannot allow ourselves to be sucked into that, not if we're going to make a change. Not if we're out to impact and influence our world. We've got to be able to talk about these issues as if we were grown-ups, right? Respectfully. And that's what's missing from so much of the debate. There was a lot of disrespect even in the Republican debates the other night. And it's frustrating to me. So, all that a preamble to what I want to say about Dr. Ben Carson. So I had this opportunity to interview him, and you can watch the interview. The link is on my blog post today. You can just go to michaelhyatt.com. I did create a short link for it, but I'm not sure that I wrote it down. Yeah, I did. Uh, vmentor.tv. I did this early this morning, and I've had a few meetings since. vmentor.tv forward slash Carson, C-A-R-S-O-N. Okay? Uh, so I link to that original video interview on YouTube where I interviewed Dr. Carson. And it's, if you, if you love books, if you love reading, if you love stories of transformation, you've got to watch that video and hear it from Dr. Carson's own mouth. Um, somebody else, by the way, attacked me on Twitter today, a professor at uh, Duke University who said that I was hijacking his story for my own ends. Yeah, guilty as charged. I was trying to make the point about uh, books are important and reading is important. 
and they can have a transformative effect on us. And um, I don't know if she read the article or not, but she evidently didn't like it. But at any rate, um, here's, the, here's the story. So he grew up in dire pro- poverty in uh, Detroit, Michigan. Um, single mom, uh, raised by a single mom, he and his brother, and they watched a lot of TV. You know, that's basically all they had, and they watched TV. But their mom, who was working really hard, working several jobs, in one of her jobs, where she worked as a domestic, she noticed that really wealthy people watched very little TV, but they read a lot of books. So she thought as a mom, who wanted something better for um, her boys, she decided that she was going to unplug the TV, which she did, and send them to the public library and require them to read two books a week and turn in a one-page book report to her. Now get this. So they did this every week. Two books a week they had to read. They had to write the report. They had to turn it into mom. Mom would look at it, make marks at it, give it back to them, make another assignment. Little did they know that she could not read. So she did all of this, getting them to read, but she couldn't read herself. I was so touched by that when he told that story. And he said everything changed for him. It opened new worlds for him. And he talked about three specific ways that reading changed his life. And I'm still a huge believer in reading. You know, I was in the book publishing world for years. I spent over 30 years in the book publishing world. Most recently as the chairman and the CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers, now owned by HarperCollins Publishing. But I got into that business because I knew books had changed my life in such a profound uh, way. And I didn't really discover books until I was uh, in high school. And then in college, um, I read like crazy, and I had a huge collection of books. And when I think back over my life, I can really mark it. You know, the major inflection points, the major changes in my life, I can almost connect them exclusively to two things. Uh, Books I read, maybe three things. Books I read, conferences I attended, and people I met. But books are at the very top. And so here's what Dr. Carson said. He said uh, there were three ways that helped him achieve success based on reading. Number one, reading created new possibilities. Because in his world, he didn't see a lot of possibility. He didn't really see a way out. But books opened entirely new worlds to him, new possibilities, um, new opportunities to visit worlds that he otherwise wouldn't be able to enter uh, into. And so books achieved that. I think the same thing is true for you and for me, we may not be able to travel the world, we may not be able to read the, uh, reach the, uh, read the rich, or meet the rich, or meet the poor, but through books, we can meet all different kinds of people in all different walks of life, in all different contexts and situations and historical contexts, and it can open uh, worlds to us. So that was the first lesson that he learned. Another lesson that he learned was it gave him a sense of agency. You guys have heard me talk a lot about this if you've been on my scopes. What's the concept of agency? It means you are the primary actor in your own story. That's right. You know, you can kind of go through life playing the victim, acting like there are all these forces that are at work that are repressing you and holding you back. And I don't deny that, by the way. And um, in part of my exchange with this um, Duke professor, she said I didn't have enough sensitivity to the issue of racism. And I just want to say, for the record, I think racism is a horrible problem. I also think that racism is probably something that all of us harbor at least a little bit. You know, the more, the older I get, the more aware I am of just how limited I am in my own experience. And I think we've got to be careful of that. And I think it's a horrible force. But what I'm saying is that our human freedom, our human agency trumps all of that. And I think Dr. Carson's story is a a great example of that. He said that he noticed when he was reading that the people who had the prime responsibility, the people who were the most important people in terms of what happened in their lives was the decisions that they made. You know, we can't always control what happens to us, but we can always, always control our response to what happens to us. I get that we live in a fallen world. I get that we live in a world where there's evil and where bad things happen to good people. And some of that we can't stop. 
But our response to that is always under our control. Ethan said, we focus so much on racism, I think it highlights it for those who don't care. Whoop, lost it. Oh, I hate that when that happens. Ethan, if you want to pop that back up again, I'll try to read it. Um, yeah, Carrie says, racism is fear of someone that is different. Yeah. You know, I think that that's absolutely true. You know, I grew up, I'm, I'm sorry to admit this, but I, I, I de definitely didn't have a, any control over where I was born. But I grew up in a community where everyone in the community, this small community in western Nebraska, was white. We had no minorities that I was aware of. And so the first time I ever encountered someone from a different race was when I got to junior high school. And there was a lot of fear. I don't know where it came from, but there just was a lot of fear. And the more now that I um, mix with people of other races and other cultural traditions and other political viewpoints, the more I see the value of diversity, real diversity, not this, you know, kind of fake diversity or this imposed diversity, but just the wonder of God's diverse creation and the, made, the way that he's made the world. All of us are important. All of us are valuable. All of us have an important role to play. And the world would be that much poorer if we didn't have the different cultural traditions and the different races and all the rest. Anyway, get it under the soapbox. So it gave him a sense of agency, Dr. Carson. And again, we're talking about the interview that I did with Dr. Carson. And you can find that at michaelhyatt.com. It's the lead blog post today, and there's a link to the YouTube video where I interviewed him. Third lesson that he learned is it really changed his self-image. Um, Dr. Carson said that before he started reading, before his mom started uh, requiring him to read two books a week, he felt like he was stupid. He was at the very bottom of his class. Um, thank you, Tiffany, for posting a link to my site. Uh, but he was at the very bottom of his class. And within a year and a half, he rose to the very top of his class. So much so that he got involved in debate. He got involved in a lot of other academic pursuits. And he went on to be you know, this uh, incredible world-class neurosurgeon, pediatric neurosurgeon. So, and, and, he, and he credits reading with starting that. And I just found that inspiring. Not as a political thing. Again, I'm not endorsing Ben Carson for president. You know, there's, if I was going to endorse somebody, it would probably be somebody else at this point. But I have tremendous admiration for him, um, for his story, for his accomplishments, for who he is as a man. And I want to say, too, I think that Dr. Ben Carson does model what it means to be a gentleman in a world that's so polarized. I think he's been very good about sticking to the issues and being humble, being meek even, and uh, not slinging mud. And so I appreciate that about him. Okay, guys, you guys hearing construction in the background? If you are, um, sorry about that. By the way, it looks like I don't even have my mic on. Maybe I should do that. Have you guys been able to hear me okay? I don't even know where it is. There it is. Hang on just one second. Let me grab it. Was it too far away from me? Is that any better? All right. Yeah. Coach Glitter says libraries are full of free content and Wi-Fi. No excuses. Yeah, absolutely. And books are relatively cheap. I mean, when you consider the content that you get out of books, awesome. Well, if you guys have questions about this topic or anything else, and thank you. Um, I see Tiffany said, yeah, I read Essentialism because of you, Michael, Coach Glitter. Great. I just gave that same book to a friend at lunch today, one of the very best books that I've read in the last five years. So any questions from you guys, please give me your name in all caps and then just give me your question or your comment. And it doesn't have to be about books, but uh, it can be about anything. Uh, Dave, your favorite fiction books. I was just talking uh, with a friend today at lunch and I would have to say that my favorite novelist, this may surprise you, is Stephen King. My favorite novel of all time is The Stand. Uh, all 900 pages of it, the unabridged version of it. Nonfiction. Okay, Lori Ann says, reading changed me when schoolmates wouldn't talk to me. Yeah, reading is amazing. Jason, top five books. I'll, I'll do better than that. If you go to my website, go to the store, and go to recommended books, there are some of my favorite books right there. Eric, are audiobooks still considered reading in your opinion? Absolutely. In fact, I would say that 90% of the, 
of the books that I consume today, I don't really read. That's kind of a euphemism, but I listen to them uh, as an audio book. And if you haven't discovered audible.com, okay, this is cool. Audible.com, or almost any book you want, there's the audio version of it there, but they're owned by Amazon. So you can get the Kindle version of it, and they have a technology called WhisperSync, and it actually puts the Audible version and the print version, so you could be listening in your car and pick up in the print edition, or I say print, in the Kindle edition, right where you left off. It's a way, an amazing way to consume content. Yeah, reading teaches self-motivation. Lori, any book recommendations on overcoming fear of public speaking? I don't know about the fear. I thought where that was going was books on public speaking, but... Yeah, Overcoming the Fear, I've got a bunch of stuff I could tell you on that. Maybe we'll do a whole episode on that, but I can't recommend a book. I'm sorry. Horentia, I also love reading poetry. I recommend John O'Donohue. Not familiar with him. Drew, have you read Unbroken? Finish it now after scope. So good. Yes. I listened to Unbroken at the gym, and I was so sad when that book came to an end. And by the way, what a twist at the end. I was not expecting how that book ended. And I, I saw the movie too, and I have to say I prefer the book. So I read the book first, maybe that's why. Brene Brown, everything by her for fear, shame, and overcoming. Yes, Coach Glitter. By the way, if you're not following Coach Glitter on Periscope, you must. Her scopes are fantastic, great energy, great advice on lighting and uh, all things having to do with broadcasting. So she's terrific. But yeah, um, so somebody else said Michael Port. Yeah, I don't know if Michael addresses the fear of public speaking, but he's terrific on public speaking. Clay, how did you handle the Duke professor and other people that are clearly ignorant? Well, I'm not so sure I'm proud of the way I handled her. I mean, I, I kind of got into it myself, and Twitter's not the best medium to have a conversation, right? I mean, 140 characters. I asked her if she'd watched the video, and she said no, she thought that was irrelevant. And I think, honestly, she was imposing on me her own story, and she thought I was saying something that I wasn't saying because all I was really doing was reporting on what Dr. Carson would say, but she just refused to watch the video. So what are you going to do? Um, James, what do you think of George Orwell's book, 1984? You know, I haven't read that since high school, so I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Yeah, Jeff Goins, The Art of Work, an awesome book. Uh, a book that I'm reading right now that I love is called The Multipliers, and it's basically about leadership. And how you can be the kind of leader that makes people smarter, better, more equipped than when they encountered you. Um, yeah, we would rather rarely treat that way each other in person. That's the problem with social media, isn't it? People feel like that just because they have a microphone, um, that somehow that gives them the right to say whatever they think and to not be disrespectful or to be respectful. And I think we really got to watch it ourselves. And, and by the way. I could be looking in the mirror right now. I'm just preaching to myself, okay? Yeah, the author of Essentialism, yes, Greg McEwen is the co-author of The Multipliers. So, yep. And by the way, um, Coach Glitter brought up Brene Brown, and I'm also reading uh, Rising Strong, almost finished with it. Phenomenal book. Anything by Brene Brown is terrific. Yeah, we need to use social media for good. Amy says, free information, free current audiobooks when connecting your library card with Hoopla. Okay, good to know. Jason says, do you know of a forum where you can discuss the current books you're reading with? I don't, other than perhaps Goodreads. Chris says, what is a good way to respond to aggression and verbal attacks in the work at workplace? Well, I, I'm going to tell you how I like to respond when I can remember to do this, okay? I mean, I, I fall prey to the same stuff you guys do. But I like what Dr. Covey said about putting a space or a pause between the stimulus and the response, because this is the thing that separates us from animals, okay, is that we have the opportunity to take a deep breath when somebody insults us or says something we disagree with, and we have a choice to make. And if we can remember to put that pause there and not respond immediately, but to take a deep breath and then to choose our response so that we don't become just like a vending machine where somebody punches a button and out pops something that we regret. So to be able to have a pause and to respond, and I think the more that we can be humble, be teachable, um, to ask them questions and to pry a little bit deeper rather than uh, answer any question, because I, I tell you what's happened to me sometimes is that I spout off 
thinking that they were saying one thing and that wasn't it at all. And if I would just ask a second or a third question, it would have given me more intelligence, more context, so that I could answer it more helpfully and more respectfully. You guys here in the construction? We've got a concrete saw going on out here. Crazy loud. Uh, Kelvin, any material on how to write a powerful book? Oh, so many, so many books out there um, on writing. I, I really would recommend you start not with a book but with a course. Get into Jeff Goins uh, course, Tribe Writers. It's fabulous. Proverbs 19.11. Sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. So he says it's not too loud out there. Uh, Josh says, how is video speaking helping you become a better public speaker? Josh, that's a great question. I think anytime you have to show up in front of a live audience like this is, it brings out the best in you. It's scary. You know, I'll be the first to admit it was especially scary in the beginning. But the more you do it, it's like anything else, it becomes less scary. So I think the thing that it's helping me do is um, I'm getting immediate feedback. People are telling me what they think. Uh, a lot of encouragement, frankly. That's one of the things I love about Periscope is an amazing number of good, kind people uh, who are giving me a lot of encouragement. And I just think just practice. You know, practice makes perfect. It's true. Yeah, practice makes progress. Coach Glitter, advice on creating your first online academy, please. Guess what, guys? I am so pumped about this. We haven't even announced this yet. Well, actually, we're running Facebook ads on it now. Next week, I'm doing a brand new webinar for free. And it's called uh, the Product Creation Blueprint, How to Develop a High-Profit, High-Impact Online Course in Seven Days or less. I've done it about three or four times, and I'm going to teach you exactly how my, what my process is and how I go through the process. It's going to be a 90-minute webinar. It's going to be the end of next week. All the details are going to be on my blog, I think, maybe on Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember the schedule right now. We've got a lot going on, but, uh, but I can't wait to share that with you guys. This is like the webinar I've been wanting to teach for so long. Please tell your friends about it. I'll have links for you guys and all that next week. We're just finalizing it. Um, we, I was working on the slides this morning, and I'm going to be giving you guys tools, the resources that I use, the equipment that I use, how I think about titles, how I make sure that I don't invest too much before I've proven the concept, all of that. Proverbs 19.11 says, Sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. Yes. I think the kind of person that takes offense at every little offense isn't very useful. And I think that's something um, you know, we have to work on as leaders is to, to not be thin-skinned, not to be easily offended. And frankly, some of the political candidates right now are a little thin-skinned. Granted, I don't know what it's like to be in the public sphere like they are and constantly be hammered. Josh says, top three tips for asking great questions. Okay, Josh, let me just try this off the top of my head. Um, number one, be genuinely curious. Start from a mindset of curiosity. You know, to be fascinated by other people, even people you disagree with, even people that you think may be your sworn enemy, but to be fascinated about what makes them tick. So that's what I'd start with. Number two, ask a genuine, open-ended question. Not a rhetorical question to prove a point, not a yes or no question or a closed question that, you know, is quickly dealt with, but an open-ended question where people can share their heart, can get inside their thinking. And then the third thing I would say is ask the second question or the third question, the follow-up question. Don't just stop at one. And, and that requires, here's what that does for you. It requires that you actually listen. Because usually when we're engaged in conversation and we ask a question, we're kind of doing that sort of an obligatory way, but we're already thinking about what we want to say rather than listening to the other person. But if you're committed to asking the second or third question, you have to listen to the answer to the first question in order to ask, ask an intelligent uh, question after that. So ask a follow-up question, exactly. How are we doing, doing on time? Well, we're about out of time. Let me take one more question. Kathy, do you find you prefer to consume a book in multiple formats now? You know, Kathy, it's true. I do. Um, I usually start with the audio book. If it's really good, then I'll download the Kindle book because now I want to underline in it and make notes in it. Uh, if it's really, really good, sometimes I'll even buy the print edition because I want a more permanent edition. I want to display it on my shelf, or maybe I want to share it with somebody else. So, yeah, I am finding that I'm uh, buying 
um, books in multiple formats now. Well, guys, I got to close. I got to get on to some other things today. I know you do too. Thanks for joining me. I never take that for granted. I'm always amazed that you guys are willing to hang out with me a little bit. So thanks for that. Thanks for your inspiration. I hope this is a great weekend for you. And the only way it's going to be a great weekend is if you decide it's going to be a weekend, don't float with the drift, okay? Design your weekend. Make it awesome. Love you guys. See you on Monday.